Anthony yeah. Albanese has arrived in Fiji for the Pacific Islands Forum and it's hard to imagine when one of these gatherings was more important. Just last night, American Vice President Kamala Harris appeared via video link to promise a substantial step up in the region with more money and new embassies, acknowledging the region had not received the diplomatic attention and support it deserved. It's particularly notable as China, which has been working hard to build its presence in the region, was not invited to appear. Mr Albanese said the controversial security agreement between the Solomon Islands and China was evidence of previous neglect, but he also noted that Australia respected the sovereignty of countries in the Pacific. We have, as human beings, two ears and one mouth for a reason, because we should use the ears twice as much as we use our mouth. If you do that, uh, you'll learn from each other. So we want to listen to what the priorities are of the Pacific from the Pacific. That's what we want to hear from these nation states. We want to provide assistance based upon their needs uh, going forward. And that assistance uh, shouldn't be a matter of uh, transactional arrangements. One of his first meetings with Solomon's President Sogavare started well. Welcome. How are you? Very well. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'm in a different shape because I came out yeah. from another meeting. What's going on? Do I get one of them too? The Mrs. P. and Grupa. <laughs> George, that was... napping. <laughs> that, was, that was a great start. Um, what's your perspective on this? There have been five decades of Pacific regionalism. Um, why is this Pacific Islands Forum meeting so significant than, than any really in recent memory? Mm. And I think that's a good place to start. That first, this is a celebration uh, of more than 50 years. Well, this is the 51st meeting. It's more than 50 years that a regional organization, it has been uh, of the Pacific Island Forum, it has been the vehicle or the forum in which these newly independent states since 1962, which were under colonial administration of countries like Australia, New Zealand, United States and France, have become independent and this is the forum in which they've come together to work collectively on issues of shared challenges in the region, but also into finding uh, solutions. So this is the first thing to, to acknowledge is, is this celebration. But also the fact that there are many accomplishments that this region has achieved together, which includes Australia and New Zealand, whether it be through nuclear um, uh, free zones or whether it be through uh, climate change or whether it be through advocacies and fisheries, this is uh, a pinnacle or, or the product of this uh, collective uh, multilateralism in the Pacific. Um, and it was, you know, it's also um, the first time in two years that the leaders have come together face to face. And there have been tensions in the last two years in terms of Micronesian countries in the north uh, prompting to split from the forum because uh, their needs were not acknowledged, especially with the Secretary General uh, vote and where... Mm -hmm. uh, and we, and we, will, we will come to that in just a moment, mm. but so continue. Yes, but, you know, and just that uh, image there of, um, you know, earlier in the year we had Sokovari speaking uh, in Parliament about Australia, against, uh, towards Australia, but now when it comes to face to face, it's a whole new uh, scene, a whole new scenario. And this is why uh, this forum such as this, when leaders come face to face, uh, is important to keep that glue uh, through this uh, regional organization going. But of course, there are teething problems and that's the evolution mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of these challenges of, of, of regionalism that we've seen over the years. Mm. And we'll talk about Kiribati mm. um, uh, surprising everybody by withdrawing uh, from the Pacific Islands Forum just a couple of days ago. So we'll come to that. But I just want to go around the panel and talk about what each block of countries represents and who, who, what mindset they bring. So we've spoken with you in the past about this wonderful new narrative, foreign policy, and it's a narrative called the Blue Pacific. And it's a story of empowerment and it's a, an assertive new way, George, of thinking about Pacific um, diplomacy. And certainly the Pacific Islands countries are going to embrace uh, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. What does it mean to start to think of yourself as a continent? Uh, it's, 
it's these frames that were given during uh, colonization, but also the type of paradigm that we think in, in terms that a continent is land-based. Here, this is a concept that goes beyond it. It says the ocean is a continent. And it touches on uh, sort of the work of early philosophers like Epelia Wolfer, that's now 30 years ago transcended into uh, policy today, that these countries are large ocean states. Their exclusive economic zones make them big states. So. Uh, after Australia, New Zealand, the third largest country in the Pacific is actually Kiribati, if you take into account uh, its uh, EEZ. And some would say the whole of Europe can fit inside um, uh, Kiribati's EEZ. That's how massive these countries are. So it's a change of mindset, but part of that is the assertiveness that these countries have come to form over the decades of participating in international politics. Uh, through their leadership in climate change, in nuclear uh, free zones, but also in the way of o oceans. And this has now, uh, this type of thinking has led into the idea of the blue Pacific, uh, that if we come together as large ocean states, uh, these uh, states can have a, a much more assertive uh, voice and role in uh, international politics. And we're starting to see that in terms of uh, the way they're trying to respond to geopolitical uh, context, uh, conquests that are mm -hmm. happening around them. It, it, that's wonderful. And your EEZ is Exclusive Economic Zone. And so in Inala, this, this idea, a narrative that came from philosophers and poets was developed by the best minds of the Pacific. Is like, we're not disconnected, isolated, poor, vulnerable island states who are, who are coming, kind of asking for aid. We are the Pacific. And, and, and suddenly they are at the crossroads of the East and West and everybody wants their attention. Now, you can either see that as a dangerous position to be in or you can say, mm, suddenly they got hands, suddenly they got leverage. Ooh, absolutely. There's great strength in the Pacific and it's centuries old. Um, and George, the way you describe um, the ocean continent is, is really important in decolonising the way we think about land and waters and First Nations people's connections to those. So I think it's a, a terrific way to change the mindset about our place in the Pacific and the way we relate with our Pacific neighbours and, and work together um, in a unified way. And I think the way that um, Prime Minister Albanese and Senator Wong have gone about repairing a lot of our um, diplomatic relationships and the, the change in message and the change in action is profound compared to um, the previous government. So I think it's terrific and I think we'll see some great things coming from the forum and I think it was a terrific message from the Prime Minister that we should listen more than we speak because diplomacy with humility is, is incredibly important and Pacific nations, um, as I said, are strong and we have much to learn from them. Mm. So uh, then we have George talking about this new assertive diplomacy, a new idea for, for foreign policy, and we'll talk about how hard it is to keep that solidarity to get together. Um, Inala's talking about the way in which Australia's perspective has changed. Jason, talk to us about what Kamala Harris is saying. I think a tripling of um, aid and support and these two crucial embassies, one in Kiribati, um, the biggest uh, exclusive economic zone, and another in Samoa. Yes. Um, so thank you, Ellen. So, you know, if, is this Pacific Island Forum different? Yes and no. When we say uh, no, it hasn't been different. It's because there are smaller countries that have come together to assert themselves and try to figure out what their place is in the world, whereas the U.S. and China look at that and have not uh, participated that much in the past. Uh, that is what is different, right? So why is that? So since 2018, the U.S. national strategy has stated that terrorism is no longer the number one priority. The number one priority for national security in the United States is strategic competition with revisionist powers, uh, China and Russia primarily, those that would try to upend what we call the liberal rules-based order US and Australia use. So this, Washington this is interested because Beijing's involved. Exactly. So uh, because uh, China looks out at the Pacific and sees it, it's the stability of the Communist Party, which is its number one interest, requires it to be able to grow, requires it to be able to continue to have access in the region. It becomes a strategic, you know, playing field for the U.S. and China. And so the U.S. sees that and it automatically becomes a higher priority. That is not saying that, that for the right reasons, they're going to lay out a list of what we call deliverables. So every time you know, we prep the VP or the president for a trip, we say, okay, what can you announce 
at this because that's always important and that's what this was that is an improvement in some of the specific areas where they can deliver but you know for the last 30 years it's primarily been about fishing um, the u.s has had preferential uh particularly tuna um uh opportunities, uh, fishing opportunities in the region in exchange for assistance in education uh, and it's in, in infrastructure, in um, health um, outcomes um, for the region. So there is definitely continuing to be that, um, uh, you know, I think we mentioned we don't want it to be transactional, but that will still be an undercurrent while we're trying to make that. It's just the fact that when these interests are at play. Mm. Maggie, you um, were involved with the Australian New Zealand Leadership Dialogue, uh, the tourism stream of that. Do you notice a different strategic outlook when you go to these high level meetings, perhaps due to China's interest, perhaps due to the change of government in Australia, all of it? Well, I think this most recent one has been really special in the context of it was almost like an opening of the arms to the Pacific and there were many of us who were attending were just thrilled to see it and I think the combination of um, Premier Ar uh, Prime Minister Ardern and Prime Minister Albanese, there was clearly a major change of thinking from an Australian government perspective that made it possible to have this great dialogue and so many of the things that we were talking about, whether it was health or infrastructure or tourism or whatever else, all came with the proviso of, but what does it mean for the Pacific? And what role can Australia and New Zealand play in this with our fellow nations in the Pacific? And did the Pacific have a voice there or were they being spoken about in their absence? Well, uh, you know, there, there are experienced players who have knowledge from a Pacific perspective, but it is the Australian New Zealand Leadership okay. Forum. So essentially that's where it was. But I think what you're going to see is a change in expansiveness and gosh, it's long overdue. I mean, I, I, I gave a speech four or five years ago about the blue Pacific and everybody looked at me like I was a strange creature from a foreign planet. You know, I mean, it's it's obviously an incredibly important change in the region and so overdue and will affect so many parts of Australia and New Zealand's business um, uh, relationships. Mm. So I guess, um, George, thinking about it, uh, the Blue Pacific is about <clears throat> a collective, a blue continent. It's about the centrality of the ocean, not disconnected states. And it's about custodianship and with that, the idea of climate change. So at the forum, Vanuatu was making a case for the International Court of Justice to consider whether inaction on climate should be considered a breach of human rights. Now, it's looking for full support from Australia, which has said it supports the process. Observers say it'll be important to see what input Australia and New Zealand have to the wording of any such resolution. Uh, George, um, can I get this straight if I can? Uh, what we are looking at is whether or not a country like Australia, that is what, the biggest uh, exporter of LNG, uh, the second biggest, I think, exporter of coal would say, oh, yes, let's support a resolution that says the people that uh, cause climate change uh, breached human rights. Whew. Uh, you, you think Australia's going to do that? Well, <clears throat> uh, let me go back first to Vanuatu. You know, this is the continuing legacy of Pacific Island countries uh, pushing above, uh, pulling up their weight in terms of uh, putting forth an agenda in international politics. And just to go back again, this is about seeking uh, uh, an opinion from the Inter International Criminal Court of Justice on climate change, um, on other on matters around uh, international law, not just on uh, um, uh, climate justice. Um, this is fundamental because while some may say we may not have teeth uh, in terms of uh, international law, what it is, an, an opinion gives um, a boost for other countries. It signals other countries to do more. Uh, it is in the best interest of Australia if it is part of the Pacific family and if this new government that talks about supporting uh, initiatives around climate change uh, should be around and, and, and be supporting. Uh, what it does, it gives um, signals to other countries, not just Australia, but all countries around the world, that there is an impact of climate change to the most vulnerable nations, uh, and that we need to address particular issues that haven't been addressed in international law, such as climate migration, such as uh, sea level rise in terms of land um, being undated or st statehood of these countries. So the opinion will give these um, pathways into uh, future areas that need to be explored, 
And I think that's something that uh, is also in the best interest of Australia. But we will get to see that on Friday, whether it will be supported or not. And certainly uh, the Prime Minister has said, look, I haven't seen the wording of it. Once I see the wording of it, but he supports the principle. Um, they've been, there's been a statement from uh, Minister Pat Conroy, who's over there, Defence Support, I think, uh, indicating that Australia is broadly supportive of this. The heart of it, I guess, George, is an acknowledgement that the countries who've contributed to the least to the problem are paying the greatest price. Mm. And, and that's correct. And that's why a country like Vanuatu has taken that on board. It is the most uh, natural disaster or cyclone-prone pro cyclone country in the world in terms of cyclones, um, and if you take into account volcanic eruptions, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, pockets of sea level rise. This is uh, why a uh, country like Manwatu is taking this up. It's not just for them, it's for other vulnerable states, such as island states in the Pacific and other countries in the world. Mm. Mm. Well, the US announcements last night included a new embassy in Kiribati, which had pulled out of the Pacific Islands Forum at the last minute. In a letter to the PIF Secretary-General, the President, Tanisi Maumau, said concerns by Micronesian countries had not been adequately addressed, mostly around representation of those countries at the Forum. For more, we're joined by the former President of Kiribati, <coughs> Note Tong. Uh, former President, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm very happy to join you and I've been listening and very interested in the discussions that have been going on. <clears throat> Were you surprised by the withdrawal of Kiribati, your nation, from the Pacific Islands Forum? Oh, definitely. I think it's um, it's unheard of. I mean, in the entire history of the Forum, the, I don't recall any any country withdrawing. I recall many countries that, uh, that were not members wanting to, to, to join in. And I do recall the time when I actually took the case up for Kiribati in 1977, uh, then an, an internal self-governing country under the, uh, the British government, the uh, colonial rule, uh, to be a member of the forum. So, no, it was quite a totally un unexpected. Mm. Now, Kiribati, of course, switched diplomatic ties from Taiwan to Beijing in 2019. And there's been speculation about whether or not um, China, Beijing, had something to do with Kiribati's decision. The opposition leader has said that the reasons put forward uh, for why it's withdrawing are really just excuses. Now, I appreciate you want to be careful speaking about your country to international media, but what's going on, do you think? <laughs> oh, we, we're going through a, quite an interesting phase, I think. Um, and I, um, I think the, 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 the leader of the opposition uh, maybe has grounds for for making that a, a, a suggestion because and uh, we mustn't focus uh, simply on what's happened with the, the Kiribati withdrawal from the forum I think we need to go back also to uh, events that uh, date back to maybe uh, last month and the um, and even last year and so things have been happening there was the visit by the foreign minister Chinese foreign minister here last month and uh, I think Kiribati was one of the two countries that was visited. And um, I, I believe there was a, an agreement signed. Nobody knows what uh, that uh, agreement uh, contained. But there were also events uh, prior to that. And uh, so with the opening up of Phoenix Island's protected area, and of course, the, the president's, President Mamo's statement much, much earlier, even as far back as last year, that uh, China might be involved in developing uh, Canton, which is, of course, uh, an, uh, a previous U.S. base uh, in, in Phoenix and the center of Phoenix Island's protected area. And so linking up these events would tend to lead one to, to draw such a conclusion as the, the, the leader of the opposition has. Hmm. So perhaps, George, pressure from uh, Beijing but when we talk about the, the Blue Pacific strategy, the narrative, the foreign policy idea, central to it is that everyone is in a Pacific family and there's solidarity. So how much damage does this cause to have this key Micronesian nation walk away from their Melanesian and Polynesian family? Mm. You know, we talk about the rule-based order. Uh, one thing that I also take into, I'd like to 
make sure that uh, people also are aware of is that when I think of the region in terms of regional politics, it's also a values-based order or principles-based order. Um, and this was when uh, the forum was established in 1971, what was then known as specific way. Certain values such as consensus, inclusiveness, respect, uh, and these, and now democracy, these values continue on today. And as Mao Mao has mentioned in his letter of, uh, earlier in the week, a key principle that uh, he felt that wasn't addressed was inclusiveness, that they were not part of these discussions of the Suva Declaration in June. And, and, so, and critically for the audience, this is about, there was apparently a gentleman's agreement that a Micronesian leader would be the next Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum and in fact it went to a Polynesian leader from the Cook Islands and this has caused discontent. Do you really think this is uh, the issue? Uh, it's one of the many factors um, on top of uh, sort of uh, other areas which uh, the, His Excellency Anote Tong has uh, alluded to. But this goes to show that Pacific, this is not the end. Uh, as part of regionalism, uh, as, as we've known, there will be, and I'm pretty confident that leaders will set forth uh, a pathway to re-engage with Mau Mau, to bring back Kiribati, just as how the Micronesian exit, uh, when it was announced a year ago, there was a pathway in which leaders um, reached out. But that's part of uh, Pacific regionalism, or what we now call the Pacific family, is that there will be an avenue to bring back to the fold um, uh, uh, Mau Mau, and hopefully we will see this uh, uh, unveiled uh, when the leaders come out of their retreat uh, announced on Friday. Okay. Yeah. Jason, how do, how, what's the view from Washington on this? Because obviously, if you're looking at strategic competition, um, it looks like Beijing just got a pretty significant country to to withdraw from this big solidarity piece around the Blue Pacific. Right, so that is a, that is a possibility. And thank you, George. I, I defer to George as the expert on, on the particular Kiribati case um, when it comes to the decision here. Mm -hmm. But um, what I always like to do, Ellen, is to take take a step back and pretend that I was the advisor to the in the, in the other. Who the, are you advising? The, who am I advising in the other shoes? Right. So I'm sitting here looking at Kiribati and saying, what leverage do I have to make it known that there was not inclusiveness in this process? And this will do it. To take the extraordinary step. And I actually, I, I appreciate hearing the values-based discussion on it because I've actually been buoyed by the amount of, of press that has come at Kiribati's stepping back from it. I mean, it's it's really been unheard of, as as His Excellency um, Anote Tong said earlier. It it's something that people are actually very surprised and a little bit, and they want, it's clearly there is a, that familiar vibe that they want to come together and, and figure out how to bring uh, Kiribati back into the, into the form. And that's, that's good to see. Um, it's not unheard of for, or, or for countries to move in and out of different alliances or move out of different organizations all the time. Um, so the fact that this is making headlines in the way that it is, um, is important. Now, when it comes to whether China is involved, um, we should just make an assumption either way. Um, and, and move forward with policy as that is. We know that China has a lot of influence um, in, for, in Kiribati, in the region in general. So this particular case doesn't change the fact that China has that influence. Mm -hmm. What I did appreciate about Vice President Harris's appearance was she also announced we are working through a comprehensive Pacific strategy. Right? And putting an embassy in Kiribati. And, yeah. and putting an embassy. Which presumably they're not doing unless uh, Mao Mao agrees to have them there. Yes, yeah, so, right. so they'd come together and they'd each have these this list of things that they can use as leverage um, for an agreement. And I will state that a, a, a opening an embassy might sound like it's a you know sort of a surface detail, but having a representative reporting directly to the president to be able to relay interests from Kiribati to the White House and to be able to discuss what those interests are and how the, the U.S. government could help them achieve those interests is not small at all. Mm -hmm. So that's a major announcement as well. Uh, Note, Tom, what's your uh, what's your read on that? At once, uh, uh, you know, the opposition leader says there's all this pressure from China, and at the same time, the opening of a U.S. embassy in Kiribati. Well, I, I think uh, what the U.S. Is, is coming up with uh, at the forum is very welcome indeed. Uh, the suggestion of um, uh, an embassy in Kiribati is something that we've always been asking for. We 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 had been uh, under the um, embassy, U.S. embassy in Fiji and then in the Marshall Islands, but uh, never really a su suggestion that one should be based in Kiribati. So this would be very welcome, and I think uh, it would be very unusual that President Mamo will not uh, accept this. I think there would be very strong public opinion to, to, to have one. And I think uh, it, uh, I think um, 
you know, we, we what what the vice president is coming with, it's uh, they're quite welcome. Some of them were there before, like Peace Corps, we lost Peace Corps, now they're, they're back, they're very welcome indeed. Mm. And so some of the things that uh, were there have gone and now are coming back, uh, it's a radical change. We are, uh, it's certainly very welcome. I just want to conclude, if I can, uh, Anote Tong, um, reflecting on some uh, views you put forward in The Conversation, a, a piece you wrote for the uh, an online publication, The Conversation, about uh, Kiribati, uh, a Pacific art atoll at times barely two metres above sea level. You wrote in it, the seas are coming for us. You've talked about, as President and since, migration with dignity. Um, what do you want Australia to understand about the need for your people to start to find permanent homes in this country? Well, I, I think uh, the, 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 the report, uh, the IPCC report, keep not only confirming, but I think upgrading the report by suggesting that uh, the, uh, the time is actually running out much earlier than uh, originally uh, indicated. And so, and uh, according to scenarios uh, put forward, uh, our islands will not be habitable uh, by 2060. And so that's not a long, long time ahead. And so we, we need to start planning. We need to really consider what our options are. Should we try to build our resilience, climate resilience, so that we can continue to stay from within up to the end of the century? Or is that something that we will not be able to do? Uh, but wherever, whatever we try, we decide we need to, they're not mutually exclusive. So I believe we should uh, begin to prepare for migration, uh, just, uh, you know, um, migration, but and uh, but if we are to do that, any relocation must be properly planned and it must be done with uh, properly programmed so that our people, if and when they do migrate, will migrate as worthwhile citizens with qualifications, able to hold a job rather than to migrate to Auckland or Sydney into the slums. OK, that's not what you, we want and that's not what you want. But I think uh, we have to acknowledge the brutal reality that uh, uh, relocation is maybe the, the, the way ahead, you know, the, the, the future option that is available to us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to us. We'd, we'd love to talk to you again about how that migration happens, how you keep culture and language and people um, together in a new uh, place. Um, mm -hmm. Anote Tong, thank you so much for joining us.